And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dr. Salgado. Welcome. Thank you so very much. I appreciate uh, all that you are doing to help facilitate this particular presentation. And it is an honor to have been invited um, to join you all uh, today and talk about this. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity to go ahead and have given a talk of this nature at the Holy Cross High School in New Orleans, um, which, uh, of which I am an alumni. I graduated from there in 1991. I'm very fortunate to be on faculty at the University of Holy Cross currently as professor of counseling and behavioral sciences. I also have the privilege to serve our community by uh, sitting as chair of the Louisiana LPC Board of Examiners, which is the uh, licensing board for the professional counselors in the state of Louisiana. And I am a board member for the Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New Orleans. I also, in addition to those interests, have a private practice in clinical mental health counseling. And I provide counseling services to individuals, couples, families who struggle with a number of different presenting issues, be it anxiety, depression, trauma, interpersonal dynamics, parenting issues, things of that nature. I also am the founder of a project um, called the Somos Felices Project. And I, I named it that because when my grandparents who lived well into the ripe old ages of 90 something. My grandfather passed away recently at the age of 98. My grandmother to 91. We're married for 67 and a half blessed years. And my grandmother's parents, um, all originally from Honduras, um, had this thing that they would say when they would sit around the, the table with their 10 children, my grandmother being one of 10 children. My great grandfather would say, isn't it true that we are happy? To which my great grandmother would respond, yes, dear we are happy. And they just rejoiced in the greatest gift that God had given them and in the greatest work that they had done together in that of their family. And that they sat around that table in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, back in the early 1900s. And that that blessing of happiness and joy and love for one another was transmitted from that generation to my grandmother's generation, to my mother's generation, to my generation. And now I, with my wife and my son and our little girl that's uh, due to be born July 3rd, we sit around our table and all of the descendants of our family sit around our tables, very fortunate and blessed. And we too declare, si sí, somos felices. Yes, we are happy. And it transcends nations, generations, language, culture, and time. And I want to transmit that and project that out to the world that uh, I happen to come from a family that is blessed enough to be able to say, yes, we are happy. I am not so unrealistic to realize that that's not everyone's experience. Um, many people have other experiences, challenging experiences, not to say that we haven't had ours, but that there's some people that have a, a tough time struggling to say that they are happy. And so that's one of my aspirational goals is to help to transmit that to other families in our community and around the world. I also have served um, in the not too recent past as the faculty assembly president for our faculty at the University of Holy Cross, which was a great privilege to do. And I also have served as president of the Louisiana Mental Health Counseling and uh, Development, uh, Cultural and Development uh, Association. And I've been very fortunate to be able to do all of that. I'm here today and for the next hour or so, we will be talking about listening to understand. And if nothing else, acquiring the skills to really just stop and listen to those that think differently, look differently, behave differently than we do. We live in a country, we live in a world right now where we are just divided. You know, families are divided. Our nation is divided. And we're divided for all sorts of different reasons, for politics, for our religion, for our ideas, for what we think, for what we say, for how we behave, for what, how we dress, the color of our skin, our different orientations. There's so many different things that are contributing to we being divided. And I hope that at the end of this hour that we can really reflect on valuing others, regardless of differences in perspectives, valuing others, 
in spite of differences. And to really take the time to listen, to understand. Then when it's all said and done, we're all human beings. We all experience hurt, pain, disappointments, love, joy, excitement. And that while we can recognize that we are different, that ultimately let's rejoice and celebrate and come to listen to understand one another in what we all uh, share in common, our humanity. I'm going to move uh, these faces to one side so I can see my PowerPoint. <laughs> Lovely faces, by the way. I just wanted to be able to see the screen. And Blessed Basil Anthony M. Moreau um, had stated that prudence is the virtue that helps to decide the best way of reaching our goals and that helps us work against obstacles standing in the way of reaching them. To understand the necessity of prudence, we only have to reflect on our purpose as Christian educators. We cannot compromise our mission or hinder its progress by acting imprudently in directing our schools. Society does not permit us the luxury of mistakes in this area. Often it takes just a minor imprudent act to ruin the reputation of a solidly established school. And this is something that, that we all perhaps could reflect upon. We might have an inclination to say something to a student or a faculty member or a staff member or anyone within our community of learners. And it's important to be prudent and not necessarily speak so quickly, you know, be slow to speak and be prudent. Listen to what it is that the other person is saying before offering one's opinion. You know, when I work with couples in a counseling session, um, when one member of the couple is encouraged to speak and say something, the other person is really chomping at the bit to, to say their perspective and wanting to say, no, settle down, settle down. Let's listen. Let's listen to see if you can understand what it is being that's said. And that's something we have a tough time doing in communication. When we communicate, we often think, all right, I want to communicate. I want to say what's on my mind. Communication, a huge part of it, a more important part of it is listening as opposed to speaking. So I would like to uh, take this time um, with this opening prayer. And this I will refer to as our opening prayer um, from Blessed Basil Anthony Moreau. Ask the Lord for prudence. Pray to the author of all wisdom that you will be given the light and necessary graces to direct and lead you in everything with the prudence and wisdom necessary to teach. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so as we proceed, I ask that we uh, engage in prudent conversation at different points of this uh, presentation. And the rationale for this training is to teach with success. Teachers uh, must know good methods, be skillful in applying these methods, have clear ideas, be able to define exactly and possess language that is easily understood and correct. All of these skills are acquired and perfected only through study. I think we must assume that good teachers are not content simply with obtaining a degree or a credential to show their capabilities, but that they also try to increase their knowledge even further by studying as much as they can. In this way, teachers are able to meet the qualifications required of them. Father Moreau was aware that not only do we teach content and we teach students, but in that, that we really need to be intentional and purposeful with our language, with our word usage, and how we direct ourselves to others, including our students. That we direct ourselves to them with the dignity and respect that is deserved by them from us. And that sometimes we may be imprudent in things that we say. Sometimes we're not so careful in how we address certain things and how we uh, point out certain things. And there's a way of being able to do so in a manner that is prudent and respectful. We live in a country, we live in a time where all sorts of things just come at us. <sighs> It's in our face all the time and it, it's there and we bring it uh, with us. We carry it with us. You know, as you look at some of the examples that I have here, as you scan through them, some of these things might produce anxiety in you. Some of these things might produce anger in you. 
Some of them I produce irritation. And so at, at a point in my presentation, I'm gonna take a moment to flash some uh, images on the screen. It'll be about a minute's worth of me just flashing images. And when I do get to that point, I'm gonna ask that you just sit and look at the image. Pay attention to how your body responds to it. Pay attention to your heart, your heart rate, your breathing, pay attention to your face, your ears. Do you feel flushed? Do you feel your blood pressure going up? Whatever it is that you experience, you feel happiness, joy, calm, contentment, whatever it is, just pay attention as I get to that point. It'll be about a minute's worth of, of images. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was far like the present day. These opening lines in Charles Dickens' 1859 novel, applies as much in our 21st century world as they did in the 19th century London. It would appear that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Ecclesiastes 1.9 reminds us, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. We human beings have struggled with the same issues throughout our history. We think we're new, we think we're unique, we think that this is something that has never been seen before and we are so foolish in that thought, this has always been this way. <laughs> It feels this way because we're experiencing it and we're living it, but others have as well. It is easy to support the ideas of those with whom you identify or agree. It is important that we attempt to provide the same support for those students with whom you do not. You know, I, in my classes, I have the, the privilege and the, and the fortune to teach. I really do enjoy teaching at the University of Holy Cross and I love all of my students. I love all of them. I genuinely care for them. I do. Some of them, I agree with what they say and I identify with who they are 100%. Others, I'm like, we are on the opposite end of everything. <laughs> I do not agree with the thing you have said. Yet I respect you. And I respect your ideas. And I respect the fact that you are vocalizing them in the classroom and I will always do so. And that we honor that. We honor that in the Catholic tradition, intellectual tradition, that we honor that in Father Moreau's philosophy and mission of teaching, and that, that we do so um, um, because we learn from it, we grow from it, and it is good to do so. If at times you show preference to any young person, it should be the poor, those who have no one else to show them preference, those who have the least knowledge, those who lack skills and talent, and those who are not Catholic or Christian. And we at the University of Holy Cross, we have uh, a number of students from a number of different faiths and backgrounds. Um, we have students who come from Protestant uh, denominations, from the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith, those who are not particularly religious, those who identify as atheist or agnostic, and a slew of other backgrounds. All are welcome, all are respected, and all are encouraged to contribute to uh, the learning that takes place in our classrooms. We are curious creatures in that we have a history of desperately clamoring to be heard by the other, crying out to express to others what we think, believe, and feel. We think ourselves and those most similar to us to be unique in our hurt and our struggle and our pain and our experiences and our having been mistreated in our insecurities. We feel unheard, disrespected, unsupported, abused, and hurt. We don't necessarily take into account that those different from us also experience life's various forms of difficulties. I started the, um, uh, the presentation talking about my personal lived experience as the beneficiary and recipient of at least five generations of love transmitted from one generation to the next and the happiness and joy and all that that has been able to bring to me and my family. That doesn't say that I haven't experienced struggles and hurt and pain and disappointment and mistreatment in one capacity or another. I've experienced all those things in my life as well, as I know others who have experienced them. 
Um, we think that those who are different from us in whatever way, face of color of skin, religion, culture, tradition, language, politics, geographic region, that they somehow don't have problems. They're sitting pretty from where they are, or oh, those those people, they they have just way too many problems, and you know we don't want to uh, interact with anyone who can you know, transmit anything negative to us per se. We all have gifts, we all have talents, we all have wonderful things with which we can contribute in a given situation, and we all have our struggles, we all have our hurts, we all have our pains. There's not one human being that I've ever come across that doesn't experience hurt doesn't feel that they have at one point been wronged in some capacity. And if we perhaps interact with one another operating from that presumption that the person that we're engaging with, however they present, they too have things with which they struggle. And that we in turn treat them with the dignity and compassion that uh, is deserved. So here's this slide again that I presented earlier with all these different images um, and things that uh, kind of come our way um, in our society today. And as I said earlier, there's some images that are gonna come up. So I believe that this is where we will begin. After this slide, <laughs> in act three, scene one of the Merchant of Venice, William Shakespeare's Shylock challenges one to reflect on the fact that he like any other is fed by food, hurt by weapons, subject to disease, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and sun. If pricked, bleeds, if tickled, laughs, if poisoned, dies, and if wronged, also seeks revenge. He like you, like me, like any other, also feels sadness and pain. He like you, like me, like any other, often is quick to anger, quick to speak and slow to, to listen. James 1.9 reminds us, my dear brothers and sisters, let everyone be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Sit with the images that I'm going to scan and tell me what it is that you feel later in the presentation. So just keep that in mind as a, as a, we, we go through the rest of the presentation because at some point I'm gonna ask us to engage in conversation. Notable efforts centered on diversity, multiculturalism and cross-cultural competencies have been implemented in recent years to educate and to address issues regarding various societal injustices. This effort is to be encouraged, applauded and celebrated. Many of the efforts thus far perhaps are limited in scope and could benefit from somewhat of a shift and that much focus and attention has been on the similarities and differences among various groups and less on the uniqueness of the individual human experience or the university thereof, universality thereof. More has to be done to capture the depth and breadth of the diversity that exists within the human experience. And this is where, where I am with this. I appreciate the fact that we have made great notable efforts to talk about diversity, multiculturalism, cross-cultural competencies, inclusion. I really do believe in those efforts, we have missed the mark. Those efforts have divided us. We have emphasized 
being white or being black, being Hispanic. We have emphasized being a US citizen or being an immigrant. We have emphasized being a man or a woman, being straight or gay. And I think that the unintended consequence of that emphasis has divided us. The word diversity and the word divorce and the word division all start with DIV. And diversity, whether intentional or not, has divided. I'm not saying let's not have these conversations about you know, black culture or pride or immigration issues. We need to have these conversations. But I would encourage us to shift to the individual, not to the group, not to white people, black people, straight people, gay people, immigrants, citizens, but to John, Mary, Latoya, Andrew, Roy, Maria, Jose, Lynn, focusing on the individual as opposed to the boxes that we check off on some demographic form. More has to be done to capture the depth and breadth of the diversity that exists within each human being as opposed to members of a group. The tripartite theory of development and personal identity is a theory in cultural identity and is based on an old Asian saying that's very similar um, in stating that all individuals in many respects are like no other. I, Roy, am like no other. I'm like some others. I'm a man. I'm Latino. I'm American. I'm married. I'm straight. I'm a father. I'm Catholic. So I'm like some others. And I'm like all others. I hurt. I feel joy. I cry. I laugh. I get hungry. I itch. I sneeze. I cough. I'm like all others. It's important, I believe, that we talk about the second one in the tripartite theory of development, which we have been doing for the past generation. I know that for me and my education, ever since I was in college, I went to college in 1991. From 1991 to 2001, 2021, 30 years now, we've been talking about the second piece of that tripartite theory, about our differences. We've neglected the first and the third part, that we're like no other. We're individual, unique individ people that need to be cherished and respected. And we're like all others in our universality. I think that those two pieces might be helpful in bringing this nation together. I think that accentuating those two pieces might be instead of brother against brother, brother with brother. I can identify with the fact that I'm unique in my own experience and like no other, as is every other human being, all 8 billion of us on this planet. We can all identify that we're like all others and that we laugh, we cry, we rejoice, we, we grieve, we itch, we sneeze, we cough. We can celebrate and recognize that as well. That unites us. And I would encourage us that as we talk about diversity issues and cross-cultural issues, that we perhaps hook our attention on those two pieces in addition to recognizing that we do have differences. I celebrate the, the different things that different people that are different than I bring into my lived experience. I have been enriched by it. I have been enriched by my Muslim brothers and sisters and my Jewish brothers and sisters and my Buddhist brothers and sisters. I have been enriched by the people that are different than I with regard to race, culture, and language. And those that are different in my ideas, be they on the right or the left of the political spectrum. So I respect that I'm like some others and the differences that those others bring. And I connect and want to connect with those that are nothing like me because I'm not like 
no other in the things that I know that we do share in common, as in the merchant of Venice. You know, we all cry, we all laugh, we all become angry. Individuals are complex in that in addition to being like some others with regard to certain characteristics, attributes, and traits, they are like other with regard to their own lived experiences. I have my one own lived experience. No one has lived my life. I recognize that everyone has their own lived experience. No one has lived their lives. I have a brother and a sister, and I love them very much. And we both, all three of us rather, grew up in the same household and kind of moved out of the household within uh, a couple of years from one another. So we all had what one would consider shared experiences. But when we talk about our lived experiences, they seem so different and we all grew up in the same house. <laughs> And think about that, three siblings growing up in the same house, yet we have three different lived experiences. We have shared experiences, but three different lived experiences. Multiply that by 8 billion people walking the earth. These experiences impact our lives and help to shape our ideas. That's why we have differing ideas because our lived experiences have contributed to that. And now we have different ideas. Ideas that differ from one person to another and that are to be respected that ought to be respected. Great strides have been made in the last several decades with regard to recognizing and celebrating the diversity of our society. Yet the notion of mutual respect and understanding toward those who think differently has not been as enthusiastically addressed. When advocates address and celebrate issues of diversity, those related to diversity are thought of thought. Those related to diversity of thought need not be excluded. When we talk about diversity, we really also need to include diversity of thought. We've excluded that. When diversity of thought is excluded from the dialogue of cultural exchange, the foundation for the potential for groupthink has been laid. And as a counselor, as a mental health professional, I am seeing the dangers of groupthink in our society. Groupthink is the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity, individual responsibility, or dissent. Groupthink is a phenomenon that is, a, is as destructive as any phobia or prejudice toward any group. Prejudice and racism is dangerous. Groupthink is dangerous. We live in a world with differing ideas that are shaped by experiences, good and bad, and this diversity of thought is to be understood, valued, and respected not stifled, rejected, or eliminated. This aspect of diversity enriches us all. Voltaire is attributed with saying, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This adage coupled with Benito Juarez, the 26th president of Mexico sentiment as well says, between individuals as between nations, respect for the rights of others is peace. This ought to give us pause for reflection. So what do we do? What do we as educators do? We have to listen to understand. We have to be student-centered. We have to be empathic. We have to put ourselves in each student's place, in each student's place. Our students are not a monolith. We may identify them with how they present as belonging to certain groups, that's an aspect of whom they are. It's not who they are. It's a piece. My being Latino is an aspect of who I am. My being Catholic is an aspect of who I am. My being a father is an aspect of who I am. My being a counselor is an aspect of who I am. You put them all together and that mixture makes up a very specific recipe that makes Roy. If I have 20, 25, 30 students in a class, I can look at see if students and I might at face value see black, white, Hispanic, Asian. And then as I get to know them, I get to see other pieces of parts of, of whom they are and how they identify. I may start to come to understand that they identify with a particular sexual orientation, with a particular political leaning, and I start to get to know. But even then, I have to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and 
look through all that noise, all that clamoring, all that mess, and look at John or Joanna, Roy, to the individual. And once I've gotten there and I've found that person and I've come to understand that person with everything that they present, I must show unconditional positive regard. And in that unconditional positive regard with the things that I come to learn about them that are very different from I, from me and that I, can, I just simply don't get and I just simply don't agree with. I, okay, that part, I don't get it. That part, I think you're wrong. I'm not gonna necessarily say it if it's not appropriate or relative to what's happening in the moment. I'm gonna be prudent and not share when I don't need to share and perhaps share if it's relevant and necessary to do so. And regardless, in whatever way that would present itself, I'm gonna do it with unconditional positive regard. I'm gonna do it with empathy. I'm gonna do it with love and respect and be genuine and sincere with the person that's before me, with my student, with my client, with my colleague. I'm going to actively listen when I engage with another human being, I need to put aside my notion of wanting to be heard myself. Oh, wait, 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 but I think this, I think this, I, I, I have a thought, I wanna say this. Take the moment to just be prudent, sit back, listen. I might be surprised and learn something. I might be introduced to something that I had never been introduced to before and come to a realization that I had never been given the opportunity to come to were it not for this unique exchange with this unique one individual that has never existed and will never exist again. But no, we wanna, we wanna talk, we want our perspective. We think that our unique experience is the only one at times that perhaps can add something, but others have positions that can add. What to do? When a student asks a charged question or makes a controversial statement, make efforts to maintain a neutral response. We're not to side with one notion or another per se, but we're professionals. We are in education and we're to create the conditions by which logic, conversation, learning can take place. Gently throw the question back to the student in an effort to understand the reasoning behind the idea and the method by which he has reached his conclusion and come to his opinion. Assure the student that there are no wrong, no wrong ideas. We need to encourage and support dialogue and conversation. Encourage discussion from other students while creating the conditions that they maintain mutual respect. Accept dissent. A differing of ideas is a good thing. Do not take personally the comments or ideas of students who are different from your own. These are exercises in, in, in learning, not in offending. Teachers who make no effort to acquire the gentleness of mind and heart that was recommended by Jesus Christ are really to be pitied, says Father Moreau. Let's not be those uh, teachers uh, who aren't gentle of heart and mind. Let's be gentle of heart and mind, like Jesus Christ. With the eyes of faith, consider the greatness of mission and the wonderful amount of good that one can accomplish. And also consider the great reward promised to those who have taught the truth to others and have helped form them into justice. They will shine eternally in the skies like the stars of the heavens. With the hope of this glory, we must generously Complete the Lord's work, Father Moreau. And so let each of us make an effort to be swift to listen. Let each of us make an effort to console, understand, and love the other, as opposed to seeking being consoled, understood, or loved. Let each of us make an effort to learn from one another or about one another. When we do, we realize that we are not so different from one another and we have listened to understand. I'm gonna stop sharing at this point so we can engage in conversation. And so we have plenty of time. And so I would like us 
to just engage in dialogue um, in the time that we have. I see, I was gonna say, I see a comment in the chat, but that's Adrian. Hi, hi Adrian. Please, I'm gonna invite you to uh, enlighten us with uh, some of your thoughts in terms of um, uh, this ongoing conversation that we're having in our, in our presentation. I'm not gonna put my camera on because uh, I got about four kids running around and it's uh it's that's so great. Thing. I love kids. I love kids. <laughs> Let them be there. <laughs> but, but thank you, thank you for uh, for always facilitating this uh, this most important uh, topic. Um, you know, being Southern boys like uh, you and I, this is uh, it's very very difficult uh, for some people uh, to hear it, but it's. Uh, it's true to our mission. It's true to who we are as Holy Cross. You know, uh, one of my favorite um, quotes from Father Moreau is that our students should not be ignorant of anything that they should know. And the problem that we have these days is we don't want to have these uncomfortable conversations. You know, we don't want to call, you know, out you know, each other, and because we have our own biases, you know, and I get it, but the people that lose out the most is our, our young people, you know, the people that we serve, and, you know, we are trying to prepare them to be useful citizens for society, you know, and if they can't have these conversations now, who's going to have these conversations with them, you know, and we have to start with ourselves in order to educate those young people, so. Absolutely. You know, and as you say that, one of the things that comes to mind for me is there was um, a movement back in the 80s and 90s um, for parents not to fight in front of their children. Um, the psychologists and counselors and mental health professionals would say, you know, if you have an argument, why don't you just go ahead and have that discussion behind closed doors? Don't have it in front of your children because that's not good for them and whatever. Fast forward a generation later, now in 2020, we're seeing some of the impacts of that. And we have children who perhaps have been denied the opportunity to see a conflict ensue. And so they grow up in a world where there is conflict and they do not know how to handle it. They run away from it. They, they shy and they become very anxious to a point where they're, they're, they're hindered. And so now the mindset is, you know what? Let's rethink this. Have conflicts in front of your children to their completion so that they can see that it's possible for them to be resolved, that they there is a way to resolve conflict. And that conflict is an inevitable part of the human experience between any two individuals, including husband and wife, for example. And if a child grows up seeing, oh, you know, my mom and dad, they didn't always see eye to eye on things. I saw them not seeing eye to eye on things, yet I saw them come to a resolution they resolved a conflict with regard to whatever, whatever that may be. So that is possible. So they grow up, they go into the world knowing that they're people with different perspectives and ideas and do not crumble and fall apart at the first person in a classroom at a job that disagrees with them or thinks differently than they do. And they're able to respectfully voice their concern or their perspective or their opinion and expect that people are going to respond back and not be fully um, stifled by it. And, and so, so now, my, now my wife and I, we fight in front of our kid all the time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but we do express our varying perspectives in front of him um, because it's healthy for him to see that it's possible for two people who genuinely love one another also don't always agree with one another. No, I completely, I, I can completely agree. And uh, it just kind of brings me back to um, what our keynote uh, speaker said earlier in his address that, you know, it's okay for us to disagree. It's okay for us to have arguments. However, it is not okay for us to disengage with one another because we're going to have different, differing opinions. You know, I, I, I'm a black man, you know, in the South. So my, my voice is not going to resonate with a lot of, the people that, you know, I'm around, you know, sometimes I'm the only African-American 
um, you know, in, in church, right, or, or at a meeting, you know, and we, we just, we, we have to understand that, you know, it's okay to disagree, it's okay uh, to have different perspectives, but at the end of the day, we can't disengage from one another, we can't uh, silence anyone or censor anyone, especially with, you know, our country on fire right now, I mean, I just, what, what a time, you know, what a time, and I, I think everything that Father Moreau has written, you know, um, it's so relevant to what we're going on right now. And we don't have to go searching for anything. It's right there for us. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for this conversation. Thank you. thank you very much, Adrian. I very much appreciate that. And yeah, we don't have to go searching, right? We don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. You know, Father Moreau lived in tumultuous times as well. He was inspired by what he saw around him as well. And we human beings, we're no different in, 20, in the 21st century than we were throughout our human experience. Um, we, we really haven't changed all that much. We're, we're the same. And, and let's go back and learn from those who came before us and apply it to our situations today. And yeah, our country's on fire and, and we need to temper things down. And I think that the Holy Cross community is the perfect type of community to do so. Um, you know, I myself find myself in situations where I'm the only one who has a certain perspective or a certain experience or come from a certain uh, background. And I'm in a situation where I don't necessarily feel comfortable, but that's okay. I need to be okay in that uncomfortable situation and not be afraid to state what I want to state in that uncomfortable situation. And I'm going to give the respect that I've been fortunate enough to receive for the most part from, from people who think differently than I. But we live in a time where that doesn't always happen either, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, but, but perhaps we, and I believe that those of us here, the Holy Cross community, are the ones that can help temper that wherever we may be in our own extended families. You know, I look at my extended family and, you know, we come from those same two people. When I look at um, my great grandparents, my grandmother's parents who transmitted that, that we are happy declaration to my grandparents, to my parents, to now my generation and the generation below me. Yet we all are in different places now. This originated in Honduras, this family originated in Honduras, but now we're throughout the United States, we're in Mexico, we're in Germany and in, in England and Spain and Israel. And so now we have different nationalities we have different nationalities. And when we talk about politics, for example, we have those that have the American perspective of those that are on the right, those that are on the left, some who have left the Catholic faith and become Protestant, those that are in Europe who have more of a European perspective of, of thinking, of thinking, those that are in Israel that have a more Israeli perspective, have some that have half I Iranian <laughs> heritage and the, the conversation that that brings to the table, um, those that are still in Latin America and in Mexico that have that perspective, and so you should see our chat. <laughs> Family chat gets on fire. Yet we have to, I think I'm one of the ones that has to bring temp because of the Holy Cross tradition. I feel very fortunate that I'm able to bring up perspectives of, okay, let's calm down. In my family, while we're happy, and there's about 500 of us now, <laughs> while we're all happy, uh, we have 500 varying opinions all over the place. And we love one another. And we, we, all, we all are in different countries and speak different languages and even have different faiths, Catholic, Protestant denominations, Jewish, and Muslim, and some that don't have faiths. And we all love one another. And we don't necessarily agree with one another. And we all have different colorings based on who we've married in the different countries. <laughs> so my family is a very good representation. It's a microcosm of what's happening in the world. And it's important that we have these conversations. It's possible to have them and to have them respectfully. And prudence is part of it. Not talking and listening is part of it. And I encourage you all to, to reflect upon this and, and speak what's on your mind respectfully and encourage others to speak what's, engage and invite others to speak what's on their mind and listen. And really try not hard to, to be understood, but really try to understand, as St. Francis 
you know, has taught us to really focus. You know, I, I, I used to, when I was young, uh, I no longer consider myself young, but I was young at one point <laughs> when I was, I feel young though, but when I was young, um, I wanted to be heard. I wanted to be understood. Now I feel fortunate enough to have gained, a, I believe a little wisdom where I'm really trying to listen to understand as uh, St. Francis invites us to do, to really understand as opposed to being understood. And I think just walking in that way and I'm like, okay, I hear you, I hear you. You know what, and I understand, and I understand. There's parts of it that I don't agree with, but I understand. I'd rather agree with someone really, I mean, I'd, pardon me, I'd rather disagree with someone and, and we come to that resolution and that notion that we uh, disagree, but that they walk away genuinely knowing that I made an effort to understand. I genuinely made an effort to understand. I hear you. I, I, I get aspects of it. All right. And I love you. <laughs> and I love you. When it's all said and done, I love you. You know. I'm curious from some of our other attendees what comments, thoughts you may have. You, uh, I'm Ken. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, you, uh, have referred to uh, by indirectly, you know, using St. Francis, the example of uh, being willing to understand to some of the writings that maybe you're familiar uh, with uh, the seven habits of uh, highly effective people uh, by Stephen Covey. Uh, he's deceased now, I guess his family is still continuing the business. Um, I, have, I have found that very helpful. Um, as I think about, other than just the obvious idea of listening first to try to understand as opposed to just being understood or wanting to be understood all the time. Um, I think about the fact that he's helped me understand this, that the, one of the other features that's connected to that is his idea of private victory versus public victory. Are you familiar with uh, Stephen Covey's work? I'm just no, I had read his book many years ago, so yes. Uh, well, it's gone through different editions and there's supplements and all that, but, and I'm not deeply into it, but I do like this. I, I've told my students now, of course, I'm revealing my per political perspective as a somewhat left of center person, but uh, I've talked to my kids about the controversies that Donald Trump, ha Trump has caused over the last four years. And one of my perspectives on that is that he's an example, unfortunately, of somebody who doesn't understand, in my view, it's only my view, who doesn't understand the importance of, of private victory, achieving private victory in effect as a priority before engaging in public victory. He's very good at the public thing. Uh, he has, he's not so good at the private thing with the connecting interiorly. And uh, I guess I would say that perspective, um, perhaps you'd have a comment, but that perspective helps me uh, with the whole idea of, well, how do you get out of this? You know, if you're, if you're locked in, public victory and you haven't negotiated internally certain ideas, uh, integrity being one of them, uh, honesty. Uh, if the public victory doesn't sync with, uh, synchronize with the private victory well, you're likely to be in trouble a lot. And I just think maybe that's a, maybe that's a piece of wisdom that could be helpful to folks who are dealing with this listen to understand thing. Yeah, I so appreciate that, uh, the way you articulated that, you know, uh, I never had really thought about that notion in that way. Um, I, I appreciate that because from, from what I'm understanding, what, what I take away from what you said, you know, I, Roy, walk my walk and I live my life privately and I have my ideas of what I think works best. And I'd like to think for me personally, that it's based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And then I try to go out and live in the world and do what I do, whether it is in my teaching or in the counseling or in playing with my son at the park, that it's lived out. And that if people see that publicly, then see they see it publicly. But I'm not necessarily going out there and you need to be doing this. You need to whatever. I'm not proselytizing or preaching or or yeah. Yeah. whatever the i'm living my life 
privately and hopefully people see what they see. It's, re it's revealing, but the expression you need to is uh, really a crummy expression when you think about it. You need to. There's, an, there's so much going on, you know, when somebody says that. Uh, it's a perfect example of, well, you know, uh, you've already made a judgment, haven't you? You've said to me that I need to do this, that, or that. Maybe I don't. If you either either not talking or there's a frozen screen going on. Everybody okay? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me? <laughs> yeah. Roy ha Roy was frozen there for a moment. He was. Yes, he was fr frozen for a short moment. Yeah. And he, I think he may still be. Roy, are you there? Are you with us? Roy is going in and out in my perspective. He's a, at yeah. the moment he's frozen. Oh, he's totally frozen on my screen. And we've got some, uh, some bad weather coming through our uh, city right now. So he may be affected by that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he mentioned that earlier. I spoke to him on the phone. He said it was, it was about to start raining pretty hard there, so. Yeah, we feel like it's been raining all week. <laughs> oh, no, you're having to gear up toward a, for a hurricane season, too, I expect. He may, I think he just logged out. He may be trying to log back in. Um, well, one of those things that... that um, uh, Here he comes. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Hi, Roy. You're muted. Unmute. Unmute. <laughs> you're mute. Can you unmute him? I can I can ask him to unmute. Ask. He seems to be saying he can't unmute. Oh. You do it as host? I um I've let's see. You look like you're live, Roy, but we're not hearing you. And it sounds like you're saying, give us a thumbs up if what you mean to tell us is that you can't, that you cannot unmute yourself. Okay. He's not able to unmute. Uh, and I can't unmute him either. I can only ask him to unmute as host, which is strange. Um, well, now you can develop your signing skills. See, you talk about <laughs> communication. This is where I take over for the great doctor. I always wanted to be a doctor and be one. Okay. okay. Um, Are you in the same area of the country, Adrian? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm at Holy Cross uh, School in New Orleans at the uh, pre-K through 12th grade school. Okay, and so I am an old timer, as you can plainly see, and very familiar with Holy Cross in the old days when they were near the canal. Uh, and I can remember standing uh, at the front door of one of the school, one door of the school, looking up, seeing the boats go by on the canal. So that is uh, the Mississippi River. It's things have changed a bit since then. Just, just a touch, just a touch. Well, I'm very, I'm unhappy that I can't seem to figure this out, but it doesn't give me an option other than to ask him yeah. to unmute. So I don't really know what else I uh, can do. He's finding some sort of <laughs> phone, oh, telephone. Yeah, if you phone. use your phone, Roy. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> go, into, go into the same, we've done that, I've done that where you can't get the audio to work, you might be able to use your phone. Of course, you have your phone with you, right, Roy? <laughs> that's, that's a prerequisite. Well, he's connecting to his phone. How about that? Yay. You're looking at the vertical. <laughs> It's, it's it's trying really hard to get you. 
thinking about it. <laughs> ah, there he is. Hello. Uh, maybe. So it, from my control panel, I can see that his video is connected, but there's no audio um, for his phone. There's no audio option connected yet. So this is really, I'll have to report this to the organizers. Hello, Roy. Can you hear us now? He's, we can see your lips moving. We're not very good at lip reading, though. That's the problem. <laughs> Could you chat with us in the chat? Ah, uh, try. We can. We can see the chat, Roy. Can't so, see the chat. gosh, you're you're getting tested on signing and on TypeScript and everything. God, talk about challenge. You don't have chat? I'm going to call you. <laughs> Do you have chat on the computer that you could use with your keyboard? Very nice drapes, by the way. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to just put you on speaker through my phone. OK. Why? There he is. You may need to turn down your computer audio, Adrian. You're getting feedback. How about now? Nice. That's good. Yeah. Okay, that may be a little bit better. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you. And now we can see you. Yes. Yeah. On the phone. Okay. Well, you know. This is the first time in a year of technology. Uh, this is the first time that I've experienced this. But uh, but if we can engage in a conversation uh, just in the few minutes that we have left, thank you for your patience in this. Um, I think I missed something. I think something was being said, and when when my computer crashed or whatever it did, <laughs> not a whole lot. And now I can't hear. Oh, uh, because of my, uh, my yeah. testing. Yeah. Give us a okay. thumbs up if you can hear. Well, my voice. well, I would like to say this. I would like to say this that as as we we leave this uh, presentation, I really have enjoyed uh, hearing the bits and pieces, and I myself have walked away with having heard um, things that Andre has said, things that and I, I I'm sorry, um, brother, um, can't recall your name. Um, that you said that I can walk away with. I think it's important for us to really, really listen. Because for me, as I listen to you, knowing that what we think introspectively, what we, the walk that we claim to walk introspectively, we don't need to be telling people and shouting it to the hills. We just live our lives and maybe people will see it and they will want to ask about it and learn from our lived experience. We too, um, our challenge to do that and learn from others' experiences. And I thank you for your time. I appreciate you all uh, being here during this hour and taking the time out of your schedule. I know that you could have gone to any other presentation. I appreciate you having taken a moment to come to this one. And together as a Holy Cross community, we can work together so we can listen to understand and um, help our students become change agents in this world that very much so desperately needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And thank you, Adrian. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. All right. Take care. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.